Hello everyone, this is Balkwell here for another mini-episode of Balkwell's Books. Uh, today's book is The Winter of Our Discontent by John Steinpeck. Now this is a fairly unique novel among John Steinbeck's work for the fact that it takes place not in sunny California, but instead on the eastern coast of the United States in a small town named New Bedford. Now, New Bedford is a town that was once prosperous. It is a port town, and during the times of whaling and trade, uh, the town boomed. The town was doing quite well. But in this new century, with these new sources of energy coming from elsewhere, New Bedford has fallen into a bit of a sorry state. It doesn't have the same holiday traffic as other sort of upstate New York towns, and it doesn't have the sort of industry um, that would propel another town to success. So it's kind of waffling a bit in this sort of in-betweeny time. And the book is really about changing times, and it's about trying to weather these sorts of changing times, what changes and what stays the same. So the main character we follow is a man named Ethan Hawley. And I don't know if it's just because the uh, name of the town, New Bedford, reminds me of Bedford Falls from It's a Wonderful Life, but I get the sense that Ethan is would be best portrayed by Jimmy Stewart, the famed actor. He's a wise-cracking man. He's very sarcastic, somewhat caustic at times in his humor, but everybody knows that deep down he has a heart of gold. His family is, was historically quite well off, a sort of semi-aristocratic sort of American family. Uh, but his father squandered all the wealth because he was not a businessman, he was a just a man, you know, and he ended up losing basically everything except the house that he that Ethan lives in, and Ethan is now working as a grocery clerk in a store that his father used to own and is now owned by a Italian immigrant. And Ethan and his family is not alone in suffering with these changing times. Ethan has a childhood friend who, in a similar sort of circumstances, uh, came from a wealthy family and lost much of what he owns and is now a drunk who lives in a little hut outside of town and really nothing can be done for him. He's in this sort of unfortunate situation. He's He's drunk and he's despairing, you know, and he doesn't even feel any need to help himself or accept help from anyone else. He's just stuck down there. And Ethan feels a great sort of sympathy for this man that it, they've been through similar circumstances and somehow or another, Ethan has ended up slightly better off while this, his friend, has ended up about in as deep a pit as one can possibly get. So all the characters in this book are weathering this sort of unprosperous time in different ways, and they're dealing with the fact that they're going to need to change their way of life, their way of looking at business, their way of looking at prosperity in order to succeed in whichever way they were finding whatever they consider to be success. Ethan Hawley is a war veteran, and he went to university after the war, and he's an educated man, and he considers himself quite smart, and considers himself morally upright, very importantly. He knows that the town is very corrupt, that the sort of leading businessmen and the leading politicians are 
basically the same people that much of what gets done in the town uh, revolves around money and revolves around sort of backroom deals but he's not involved in any of that partially because he doesn't have the money and partially because he feels that there should be some way to get through this world properly morally that success should not be only reserved for those willing to sell their soul in order to get it and his main conflict is between this ideal his moral ideals and the fact that he feels a great shame for where he is in his life he's a grocery clerk you know he stands behind a counter and sells people food he takes deliveries he stocks the shelves i mean he runs the store basically by himself the owner has arthritis and is basically absent uh, from the day-to-day -day running but he doesn't have this sense of ownership uh, Ethan that is he doesn't have this sense of ownership over what he's doing he's feels a uh, shame in working for somebody else when he knows that his family used to be better and he knows that everybody else in town looks at him as someone who should be doing better someone who was let down by his father's poor business dealings and who they expect to rise back up at some point but he hasn't quite done that and his wife who's a very nice lady but she wants certain things uh, certain material possessions that would make her respectable because be, um, in the same way that her husband is looked down upon she's looked down upon too um, for not being as rich or successful for not having the things that other people want and Ethan's children he has a, a young son and a young daughter uh, also feel this way his son in particular becomes obsessed with money and fame and this new style of fame this television fame and his son is probably around 11 or 12 and he is amoral and somewhat nihilistic and he's looked at the world around him he's looked at the world of new bedford and realized that corruption is the default that if you want to succeed in this life you need to do some bad things and you need to trick people and the sorry, Ethan cannot influence him himself because his son looks at Ethan and says well this guy's not up to much you know and he looks at everyone who's successful everyone on television and says well these are the people I should be looking up to and Ethan certainly feels a, a large amount of almost like he's letting his son down that he can't set a better example that he can't prove the counter example that you can be morally upright and succeed in this world and it's hard to convince an 11 or 12 year old boy the value of being morally upright when it doesn't get you the things that you want in this world so Ethan st throughout the book is struggling to decide how much of his this sort of moral character of his he's willing to put aside he there is so much pressure on him to succeed pressure to give his family nice things pressure to relieve some of the almost disdain that people feel for them as a sort of fallen family fallen from riches to a sort of lower still middle class but just getting by sort of existence and he starts to wonder if it's not altogether incorrect to set your morals aside every once in a while in order to get what you need he's sort of turning towards pragmatism he's coming from a sort of idealist moral um, philosophy 
and veering towards pragmatism because of all these pressures of the world. And he's a smart guy, and he's a clever guy, and he knows that if he wants to, he can make money. If he puts his sort of foibles, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, if he puts his sort of moral nature aside for even a brief moment, he can make a bunch of money and then go back to being moral afterwards. And he sees that the people around him don't see morality the same way he does, that the businessmen who succeed are very willing to sort of separate their life into the immoral actions they do and their true character, and that they don't believe they're bad people because they do bad things every once in a while, and then once they have what they need from them, they go back and they live what they think is, is their good life. And he says, well, why can't I do that? Like, what's what's wrong with me that I can't just succeed in the way everyone else does? Why don't I just put it aside for a second, get some money, and then I can be a good guy again? But there's something there's something stopping him. And every time he he thinks about doing something he considers immoral, for example, um, a man comes by and offers him a bribe to take a certain product or maybe insurance for his store um, to convince his owner to buy this um, in exchange for a little bit of bribe. He'll get like 5 or 10%. And he says to this guy, you know, get the hell out of here. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. And then eventually he starts to think, well, maybe... Maybe I should take the 5 or 10 percent. I mean, everyone everyone does it. However, then his boss, it turns out that his boss found out about this, that his boss knows that he rejected the, um, the proposal, the bribe, and his boss is very appreciative of it. However, his appreciation doesn't mean much. I mean, he doesn't give him a raise, and he doesn't really do much. He buys him a little Easter egg for his children for Easter. But still, there's this sense that he's getting rewarded, and there's this sense that there are rewards pending for his moral actions, that even though it seems in the moment that doing the bad thing will get him the good results, there's this sense that if he does a good thing, long enough, then things will start to work out. One Another interesting thing about this book is the way that it plays with the reader's expectations and the way that it keeps the reader in the dark about much of what's going on. The book begins from a third-person perspective as we're introduced to Ethan Hawley and shown sort of a day in his life. Then, then the book changes to a first-person perspective for much of it, where we are inside of Ethan's uh, thoughts. However, even during those times, there's a lot that's hidden to us about his true intentions. We see what he's doing, but we don't know exactly why. During the third-person um, sections, we see him perform a bunch of actions and we learn a lot about him but we don't know his his past we don't know his his true history we don't know how he feels most importantly about his history about these pressures on him during the first person sections we see the struggle of with his morality the struggle with the, his history you know whether he thinks his dad was a good person or not whether he blames him for his losses um, in business and this sort of interplay helps, this interplay makes the reader have to really work to understand everything that's going on in the book. It's all there before us, but we have to put a lot of the pieces together. And sometimes it's ambiguous as to what exactly Ethan is planning. <coughs> Whether he has decided to go through with these sorts of uh, crooked acts or not. For example, very early in the book, um, Ethan is friends with a bank teller, and the bank is right next door to his store. And they begin talking about the best way of pulling off a bank heist. When is the time to do it? 
um, why people are caught, why they don't succeed, and such forth. And Ethan thinks, God dang it, I'm a smart guy. I could easily pull off this bank heist. And in much of the book, he's sort of putting pieces in place to perform this heist. And he never quite decides exactly that he's going to do it, but we see he's gradually working, he's thinking about how long it'll take to do certain parts, um, finding the weapon he's going to use to threaten the tellers and, and such forth. Like he's putting this all together. But you never quite know when it's going to happen or if it's really going to happen. How serious is he about this? And this way of keeping us in the dark and hiding the intention is extremely well done in this novel and it makes it feel it makes us truly believe this struggle that Ethan is going through because in the way, same way that he can't decide what he's going to do we can't decide what he's going to do we can't tell and we know and we can't tell because he doesn't know it's not that we're, things are being hidden from us necessarily. It's not that Ethan has decided something and we're not told about it. It's that Ethan himself does not know what it is that he's going to do. He doesn't know what sort of life he wants, um, whether he wants to gain success at the cost of his soul, perhaps, or whether he's willing to stay in the position he's in right now um, and continue to be a good person. So it's quite an interesting book in that respect. There's a lot of interesting characters on the side, and really this, this struggle is extremely empathetic and presented very effectively. I mean, John Steinbeck is truly a master of this sort of work, of allowing us to see a character's daily life, to see the mundane in their life, and to understand them without fully understanding them. Almost like you could understand a friend you feel like you understand a friend of yours, but you're never quite sure what they're going to do, what exactly they're feeling, even though you do feel a, a, you know, a close connection and understanding for them. And John Steinbeck's characters often end up feeling like our friends, like people we know quite well, <clears throat> who even at times when we disapprove of what they're doing or disagree with them, uh, we feel that somehow we can understand them because we are connected with them. So I think this is really one of his great works. And I think beyond the inner struggle of Ethan Hawley, you see the ways that America is changing at the time. You see the way towns are changing and the way people's morals are shifting. But it's not just a case of, you know, the world's getting worse or things are turning bad. It's just that things are changing. It's that there have always been wealthy people. There have always been corrupt people who will do anything for their wealth. The things they have to do change over time. But the way they go about it, or the general principles of the thing, don't change that much. And we see that in Ethan Hawley, that even though times are changing, there's still this foundation of moral principle that one can carry through, even in the worst of times, and even through despair and desperation that Ethan Hawley certainly feels in this book. He reaches some extreme lows, but he's able to pull himself through and part of the reason he's able to pull himself through is because of his children, particularly his daughter. 
Now his son is a bit of a jerk, and Ethan, although he loves his son and feels that eventually he'll come out of this phase of being a, you know, basically a brat, he he doesn't like being with him very much during this moment of his life. Uh, he finds him annoying and somewhat reprehensible in his desire for fame and is willing to do anything um, for for what it takes. However, his sorry, everything that it takes to, to get what he wants. His daughter, however, although she has a bit of cruelty in her, she has a sort of moral compass that comes out at the end of the novel. She does something that is very difficult for her, but is absolutely the right thing. And when Ethan is feeling this torment at the end of this novel because of something his son has done and because of all this stuff that has happened throughout the book, he thinks of his daughter. And he thinks of the good thing that she did. And he thinks that I need to show that a person can stick around in times like this, a person like me can continue to exist and to thrive in order to leave a light on for the next generation. That's a very beautiful thing, you know, because it's a, it can be a bit of a depressing novel and it can feel like it's going to a very bad place, but there's a light at the end, there's a hope at the end. And um, I consider that to be very valuable in a novel, that the darkness is at least, if not balanced, at least there is a little bit of light there uh, for us to, to carry with us as we go on in our life. So I would greatly recommend The Winter of Our Discontent. I think it's one of John Steinbeck's great works, and he has quite a few of those great works, that is. This has been another episode of Balkwell's books. I've been Balkwell. Um, You can subscribe to the show on Apple or Spotify, or you can subscribe to the channel Balkwell on YouTube, or you can find the podcast in many other places wherever you find podcasts. If you like the show and you know anyone you think would also like the show, please tell them about it, spread the word, Um, It would be very helpful and nice for me and for everyone. If they end up liking the show, they'll be happy too. You can visit my website at balkwell.substack.com. That's balkwell.substack.com. All the episodes are posted there. Uh, You'll get an email whenever there's a new episode, and I also release... Uh, nonfiction essays every two weeks, every other Thursday that you can read. Many of them are about literature or literary in some respect. So if you like books and if you like what I'm doing here, you will probably like those as well. I am planning to release a novel of my own uh, in about a month's time. So you can... uh, Keep your eye on that. Any news about that will be on the website as well. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.